Hi, everyone who's joining us. Let's wait a couple minutes as people trickle in to the form. We'll give one more minute and then we'll start. Okay, let's uh, get started. So my name is uh, Albert Park. I'm one of the co-PIs of EnviroLab Asia and EnviroLab Asia is a um, initiative at the Claremont Colleges to study environmental issues in Asia and globally. And it is uh, rooted, uh, anchored at Claremont McKenna College, but it is a five college initiative. Uh, this initiative uh, has done uh, many things uh, from research to supporting teaching. And we also um, hold our, I think, most important component uh, every year, which is the clinic trip, the class in the clinic trip. Uh, this upcoming year, we will be holding our um, uh, uh, so we'll be holding our clinic trip, which we weren't able to do last year uh, or the previous year because of the pandemic. But next year, our clinic trip will be focusing, our class in the clinic trip will be focusing on China. Um, we'll, we'll be announcing in the fall uh, the application process for students to apply to become student fellows, uh, to be part of the class in the spring uh, 2022. Uh, and then be part of research labs within that class, and then to uh, take a clinic trip to parts of China uh, in May 2022 for two weeks. So uh, it's my pleasure today to um, introduce and to host uh, this, uh, this event, which uh, is a great, um, I think, moment to, see the first class of EnviroLab Asia fellows who uh, I think it was believe 2016, we went to um, Malaysia, Borneo and Singapore. And uh, we uh, were traveling to do a work to study oil palm uh, and uh, dam issues, water issues for two weeks together in uh, Southeast Asia with Yale and US College. Uh, we had a lot of fun. I think we learned a lot. We really got to know each other uh, really well, considering the fact that we were in the jungle together, I remember, and uh, uh, with limited limited services here and there. And it was a great time. And I, I, I have great memories of it. And uh, this, this, this class of um, fellows who are here today, some of them are here today, uh, were really remarkable in every way. I mean, remarkable in every way, academically, personality-wise, I mean, all get along and they really set the foundation for EnviroLab Asia uh, for uh, then and now. And so I'm so ha happy that they're taking the time out from their very busy lives of grad school, teaching, working and so forth 
to join us for this time to talk about their experiences uh, since EnviroLab Asia, since they've graduated, and to see how EnviroLab Asia uh, has helped uh, influence them or has contributed to their lives in some way. So uh, what we'll do today is uh, I'm going to let each of the panelists go around. I'll call on you and just introduce yourself uh, for about five minutes. Uh, let us know right, who you are, you know, you know, the typical things you do in first day of class, college, you know, what was your major, but then of course, talk about what you're doing today, the exciting things that you're uh, doing today. Um, afterwards, then I have uh, about three questions that I'm going to just throw out to the uh, panelists and to see uh, and to just ask um, them to uh, answer uh, answer these questions, and then we'll leave some time for um, our Q and A. So um, let's get started. So I'm going to go by the order on my screen, and let's go with uh, Elizabeth first. Hello. Hi, everyone. Um, I am Elizabeth. I graduated from Pitzer in 2017 with a double major in environmental analysis and Asian studies. Um, I have done a different job every year since I've graduated college. I did a year of AmeriCorps working with FEMA, then I did a year working with FEMA. I was living in Puerto Rico for a while. Then I got a Princeton Asia Fellowship and I lived in Beijing working for the Natural Resource Defense Council until COVID hit and then I got sent home. Um, and since then I have become a Food Corps AmeriCorps um, teacher and I teach garden and nutrition education in Oxnard, California. And I live a block from the beach, which is really cool. And I just got into grad school for public health. Um, so that is my next step going forward. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, Isabel, you wanna go next? All right, hi everyone, I'm Isabel. I also graduated from Pitzer in 2017. Um, I double majored in organismal biology and environmental policy. Um, since then, I was pretty ready to leave the States. I'm originally from Hong Kong, so I was craving being back in Asia. And I think the EnviroLab trip definitely solidified that for me. Um, and I moved to Singapore, where my mom is from. So it was nice to grow up um, in a different place of one of my parents. And there I worked for a, a company that took students from ages eight to university students on field trips around Southeast Asia. We went to Malaysia, Indonesia, Vietnam, all, all sorts of places. And funnily enough, um, I actually took a Yale and US trip. I took a, a freshman class to um, Lombok and Bali and it was just pretty full circle to be able to go back to that university and actually work with them again. Um, but yeah, after two years at that job, I felt like it was ready for me to pursue my master's degree, which has been a lifelong dream of mine to pursue a master's in marine biology. And before then I did all of my dive certifications. I did open water all the way to dive master, um, got really into underwater photography and wildlife photography um, and moved to Australia before the pandemic, well, kind of in the middle of it in January, 2020. And I've been there since studying at James Cook University in my second year of marine biology. Um, and in my last semester, I'll be doing my research project. So that's something that I have to look forward to. Thank you. Great, great, thank you. Uh, Janave, you wanna go next? Yeah, hi everyone, I'm John V. I graduated from Claremont McKenna in 2019. So out of the five years since uh, our EnviroLab trip, I was at college for three years. So I'd say that, that the trip shaped a lot of my college career. But since then, I work at Intuit, which is an accounting software company in the San Francisco Bay Area. And um, yeah, I'll talk more about how EnviroLab shaped that journey. But it's really good to see everyone here. Thanks, Jenna. Um, Maddie, you're next. Hi everyone, it's so wonderful to see your faces. Um, I, yeah, I graduated from Pomona in 2017 with my degree in environmental analysis. 
I didn't really know what I wanted to do next. So I worked as a research assistant at the University of Michigan School for Environment, um, working in like case study education, sustain sustainability education. I went on to do my master's at the University of Cambridge. The next year I was in the land economy department um, looking at uh, land tenure issues and community mapping, which we learned a lot about on our EnviroLab Asia trip. Um, then I, I stayed on at Cambridge as a research assistant and randomly due to the pandemic um, had to leave the UK and took a job working on a daytime talk show, which is very random curveball. Um, that was a six month gig. And I actually just went very full circle to my palm oil roots and I'm working at a, a company in the Bay called SCS Global Services on their palm oil supply chain auditing and certification team. So that is me. <laughs> Thanks, Maddie. Uh, sorry, so sorry to interrupt, Albert. I for, I totally forgot to mention my major in my oh, excitement yeah, to say yeah, hi to everyone. Fun. But I, I majored in science management and I work as a product manager now. Yeah. Perfect, thanks. Uh, John, go ahead. Hello, uh, hi, my name is Johan and I was a history and government uh, dual major at Claremont McKenna College. I was, let's see, what have I done since then? Since I graduated in May 2018, I have came back to my homeland of Singapore and have been working as a teacher. I did my postgraduate education, diploma in education and also spent a few months teaching in the Philippines for ultimately returning back home to teach. And as far as like involvement with environment goes, I think it was quite eye-opening for me to go to the Philippines where their social studies curriculum includes like quite a huge discussion on environmental issues just something that we didn't actually have in Singapore. So to make that connection between what I learned on EnviroLab Asia and what I was teaching in another country was very interesting. Yeah. Great. Thanks, everyone. It, it's so, it, it really is so wonderful to hear how well you all are doing in such diverse jobs. And of course, we knew you do do so well. That's why we accepted you as, uh, as fellows, right, out of so many applications. So it's, it's so nice to see that um, things are going well. So let's, let's just get into the questions. And the first question I have uh, for all of you is, you know, um, how do you think EnviroLab has impacted your postgraduate life? Um, and uh, what I can just call again, and we'll go in different order. How about, um, uh, Isabel, do you want to start first with that? Yeah, so yeah, I thought about this question um, quite a lot, and I think it has shaped my postgraduate life in very interesting ways. So obviously, um, it helped solidify the fact that I wanted to work in Asia for the rest of my life, um, brought me back to Singapore. And during my job, I was very, I was teaching conservations, and actually, um, we were teaching about palm oil as well, because we visited a few plantations and the international school community in Malaysia and Singapore um, actually directly like encounter the effects of, you know, the pollution from burning. And so it was, yeah, again, a full circle moment to be teaching that to younger students um, and to be involved in that sort of work again. But I was craving the sciences by the end of my job. So that's why I pursued my master's degree. But now that I'm studying like a very sciencey major and very involved in, I just feel like I'm in this education space where everyone's very interested in pumping out research. And like, you have professors that are specialists in one specific goby or like a coral. And it kind of like, I'm brought back to um, my time at Pitzer and EnviroLab and just now I'm craving that like human aspect. And I know that my future has to be, um, I know that I have to have both science and social science um, with the human dimension livelihood aspect. 
related into it in my future because I want my work to have an impact. I want there to be a conservation um, kind of focus, but I also know I really love research and science. So I'm, as I'm thinking about the future, I am pulling um, events and things from the past from EnviroLab, from Claremont, of how I can make that work for myself and what that means for the future as well. Great, thanks. It's great to hear about the cross-disciplinary influence, which we always try to em emphasize in EnviroLab Asia. So I'm glad to, glad to hear that as well. Um, let's see, how about uh, Janavi, do you want to go next? Yeah, um, I feel very similarly to Isabel in that uh, because I did EnviroLab in my freshman year of college, I was introduced to academic intersectionality for the very first time. And I came in as a pure chemistry major, but very soon after wanted to do more. So I ended up taking a lot of classes like environmental econ or environmental chemistry, um, public econ, just classes that tried to talk about multiple topics in a more end-to-end -end manner. And I think eventually that way of thinking is what led me to tech, just like being able to think about problems, not just from one person's perspective, but from multiple perspectives and how different people see different problems and then solving a problem for like a, a type of person, which is what EnviroLab taught us. Like environmental problems aren't just theoretical, they're, they're felt by real people. And when we got to interact with those real people, it really drove that home for me. Um, so I think beyond like developing an academic interest and uh, the research that I was able to do with all of the professors I met through EnviroLab and the classes that I took and eventually the thesis that I, uh, I did that was also connected with EnviroLab, it changed the way that I think about the world. It like made me a much more active environmentalist in my day to day and like the way that I talk to my friends or uh, even at the workplace. and. Um, it made me much more aware of like my lifestyle choices and and how I expend my energies. So yeah, lots of different impacts. Great, that's yeah, and I'm glad to hear that impact, especially your 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 career. Um, um, yeah, and then I remember, and also you did um, fantastic research for me. So I, I I'm eternally grateful for all the research, and it, that will soon come out in a book, hopefully. So. Um, <laughs> Let's see, how about Elizabeth, you wanna go next? Yes, I'll go next. So I, I agree with Isabel and Jonavi. I, I feel like there's a lot of subtle ways that EnviroLab has shaped my path. And as I was thinking about it, I was trying to figure out all the different ways that like research and writing and like, pe like professor peer interaction um, has really influenced my postgraduate life. But I think the main, or one of the biggest tangible kind of um, choices that I made was to do the Princeton and Asia fellowship. And I think I was able to do that to just, I had never really lived abroad. Um, and so moving to Beijing seemed like a big thing for me, but I knew that I'd had this experience. I had um, researched, I had worked cross-culturally. I was ready to enter an office that was um, all Chinese, all Mandarin speaking, um, which was very scary for me, but also something that I was like, I have, I haven't done this exactly, but I've done something similar. I have research. I can do this cross-cultural research um, in another country. So I think it gave me, it, it just made me feel a little more comfortable doing something that felt a little scary. So that was my biggest takeaway. Yeah, the, especially the, yeah, the, the cultural experiences. Yeah, I can see how it shapes and when you go to China otherwise, because yeah, we were studying everything about Asia too. So um, Johan, how about uh, you next? All right, um, okay. Uh, so the questions on how it shaped my post college plans. Yeah. All right, cool. Got it. I was writing it down, you know, just, just in case. Um, so it didn't really shape what I would do because I was, a, I was always going to be a high school teacher, but it definitely shaped how I would do it and how I have done it so far. And I think the two, two key aspects I would like to talk about. I think the first one is something that uh, Professor Park and uh, Janavi mentioned, um, the idea of cross-disciplinarity. I still remember being as a student in EnviroLab Asia, the student fellow, and being out in the jungles of uh, Miri Sarawak and having like, you know, 
different faculty members talk about different things from like disaster management to the politics of it to the history of the region and to like ast astronomy and I found it very impactful that whole idea of like approaching a singular issue from so many different angles because it really helped me break you know the invisible barriers of uh, academia you know like between the different subjects and fields and for me, it has inspired me as a teacher to approach issues in a similar manner and, you know, urging my students to, you know, not see issues as just like a history thing or, a, you know, a environmental studies thing or where it becomes more, approach it in a very multifaceted, holistic manner. And I think the second key learning point I had, and I think this is similar to Janvi, is I wasn't the most, um, environmentally act, most active in environmental activism before I went on EnviroLab Asia. So it kind of planted like a seed in me. I have to thank Professor Park for encouraging me to apply. Um, and I remember looking at the activists who were uh, protesting the Baram Dam in Sarawak. And, you know, not, not just their passion, obviously, but also how they went about it. And I found myself, you know, to be very inspired by them, even though the cards were stacked, the deck was stacked against them. They really were, you know, going at it. And, you know, they even succeeded in the long run, as we all may have recall reading about. And so as a teacher, and I shouldn't be saying this officially, but as a teacher in a public high school, I do encourage my students to, you know, speak up, you know you see something say something and also like go out there and make a positive difference in the world because a lot of people believe that they can't and i want to tell them you know that you can and you if you believe that you cannot make a positive difference in the world then you wouldn't so you have to at least try <laughs> so yeah great thanks johan um for that uh letting us know about how it impacted your life in, in singapore especially your teaching too uh maddie okay go ahead yeah, so um, the trip for me was very much closing the loop on um, an, an interest and a passion I'd had for a long time. So I learned about palm oil when I was a Girl Scout, actually, and led a campaign for eight years to get the Girl Scouts to adopt a sustainable source of palm oil in their cookies, um, ultimately convincing Kellogg, which was the baker at the time and Cargill and Wilmar to adopt deforestation free policies. And this was with a whole coalition of NGOs. So it certainly wasn't just our campaign, but um, you know, it was how I grew up and it was a really, really interesting experience to join the trip and to learn and to not feel any pressure to kind of have to speak about things from an activist approach, which is all about you know, like quick sound bites for a media interview it tends to be very black and white. Is palm oil good? Is palm oil bad? It was just a really reflective time for me. Um, and also, I like, you know, we had we had been negotiating with with Wilmar, but we were actually we visited Wilmar like as a field trip, you know, and um, got to speak with their representatives and just gave me a lot more empathy and understand and understanding I think just because my worldview was just very western advocacy focused um, and that really shaped what I would go on to focus my dissertation research at Cambridge we learned a lot about um, land tenure issues and the importance of community mapping and land titling and my research was focused on on the benefits and limitations of community and participatory mapping um, and meeting the needs of indigenous communities who often have collective land ownership or shifting land uses, which are really hard to map, and how some of those differences um, create really real problems in negotiation settings or land rights settings. Um, so yeah, just that social engagement side and thinking um, really critically and carefully about, um, you know, like international students coming and in, interviewing communities, the ethics behind that. And often um, as research subjects are participants, it's not a very equal ownership of research outputs. Um, so yeah, it got me thinking a lot about the social engagement side of palm oil, whereas beforehand I was really focused on the environmental side. 
and the consumption as opposed to the production side. So now um, my job is really focused um, on production and ensuring traceability along the supply chain. Yeah, I mean, thanks for those uh, th those comments. Um, and it uh, it just makes me remember, but I think all of you remember that we just we're exposed to, we're exposed to so many different voices, right, and different perspectives, right, and and learning from right people who are trying to deal with the palm oil issue, like from the from the producer perspective, at like Walmart, right, definitely going there um, and hearing from them and hearing from people on the ground who are fighting against building the dam that was affecting all the palm oil. So there's a lot of perspectives um, going around um, that uh, I, we were all exposed to. Um, and yes, the, your Girl Scout initiative is very significant. And I have the boxes here because you know, it's Girl Scout cookie season, right? And my, my daughter's a Girl Scout. So we have around 30 boxes because we just love Girl right. Scout. And I always point, I say, you know who, you know, who helped do this? You know, mm -hmm. You know, Maddie. So that's great. That's wonderful. Um, okay, so let's go on to our, our second question. Um, so, what are you know tangible skills, like really tangible, practical skills or knowledge, which have helped you with what you're doing today? Did you gain from your EnviroLab experiences, right? So, what really, anything really practical or tangible? Um, this, uh, uh, Elizabeth, why don't you start first? Okay, so the first two tangible skills that come to mind are networking to a certain degree or collaborating and writing. So uh, I, I, I specifically research-based writing, which I, my background is not, or my underground, uh, undergraduate background was very not, there wasn't a lot of research, I guess, involved in it. When, I can't remember that much. It's been like five years since I graduated and my memory is horrible, but I only remember the research and the time together as EnviroLab Asia. Like my other classes, I can't really remember what I researched, but like my EnviroLab research, it's it was a multi-year period. So that there was this one idea that we carried through for two years. And I thought that was so valuable to be focusing on one topic and bringing all these different professors and all these different students from different backgrounds together so we could all talk and write and research and discuss this one idea, which eventually formed into other ideas and other uh, kind of branched out. But I thought that was very valuable just to have that collaboration and specifically focus on my research writing skills. Um, and I think that has kind of carried out into my postgraduate uh, life and the jobs that I've had. I feel like I can, I have the research skills, um, which I don't think I would have had if I hadn't done EnviroLab. So research writing, collaboration are my big three like tangible things. Great, thanks. Uh, Maddie, do you want to go now? Sure, yeah. I mean, I think like I was kind of hinting at this, this experience was also like Elizabeth mentioned was my first real on the ground field research experience and something I had to think a lot about for my master's research was around my positionality, working again with, um, with uh, communities who are marginalized. And a lot of the literature kind of puts indigenous groups in this category and speaks in very general terms. Meanwhile, like indigenous communities are very different. There are multiple ethnic minorities and differences and we kind of group and homogenize um, groups of people frequently in research and so it just got me thinking about this and what can I do as a researcher to make the research process more useful for the my research subjects which yeah it's just it helps me think more critically about field research um, and also I think I'm not sure this is a, a skill but just it really showed me the value of um, international learning environments. I maintained a lot of friendships with Yale and US students, and it convinced me that I wanted to get my master's um, outside of the US. Um, Cambridge was a very international environment. I was often the only American in my classes, and um, that was hugely inspired by just the, the international and cultural exchange that happened on the Environmental Asia trip. 
Great, thanks, Maddie. Uh, Isabel, how about you? Yeah, so um, I also agree that I came out with um, more experience in the writing realm as well, because um, we, I think a bunch of us contributed to this article um, where we kind of chose a topic and wrote about it and um, Char Miller helped edit it or something. I, I My memory is like a bit shoddy, but um, yeah, I think that provided me with like real practical experience of like writing a collaborative research paper with everyone and how like how to put it together in a way that makes sense. And um, especially because it was also interdisciplinary. Um, and I also remember we had a conference and I gave a presentation at the conference, um, which was also my first real like practical experience giving a presentation at a conference as well. Um, so I really appreciated being able to actually learn those skills and practice them um, during my time at EnviroLab. And I think, yeah, to touch on what Maddie said as well, learning to collaborate with people, keeping an open mind, especially when we're working cross-culturally as well as um, across so many different disciplines, like from music to astronomy. Um, it just taught me to keep an open mind in that regard and not be so single-minded in the way that you approach um, topics or issues and that there's always something that you haven't thought about from someone else's discipline or someone else's perspective. Um, so yeah, definitely those three things. Great, yeah. And um, the work that you're talking about, just for anyone who doesn't know, uh, pretty much everyone in this room contributed some writing piece either to our blog on our website or to on our web um, online journal in our Lab Asia where we did talk about uh, palm oil and so forth which you, you can read all their um, great essays on it that they worked on. Um, okay, uh, how about Janavi, you want to go for it next? Yeah, um, I think very similar to what Isabella and Maddie said, I got introduced to field research through EnviroLab Asia. And um, after having done it with the program, I ended up doing multiple other field research trips to Costa Rica. And then for my final thesis in which I studied uranium mines and the impact of that on the environment and the people around there. But field research was like kind of the, the doorway that introduced me to remote sensing and GIS and like a lot of other tangible tools that I used in academia throughout my college career. And um, now I feel like I have an alternate life or like a future life in which I will continue to study um, sustainability, but with its intersection on, on technology. So I, I hope that I'm able to bring those two together and, and think about solutions with, you know, a, a tech perspective or, um, yeah, just like the end-to-end -end problems sort of thing that I was talking about earlier. Um, another thing that I think I thought a lot about my senior year and when reflecting on EnviroLab was just how easily I was able to talk about my field research and even my thesis at job interviews. Like I was doing something, I was interviewing for jobs very different than what I was studying. and I. I could talk very passionately about the stuff that we had learned about because I was able to connect it to, to the people that I was talking to. And it got people in job interviews really excited about what I was studying and how I thought. And so the the other tangible skill I think I learned was just critical thinking. Like, how do you put yourself in someone else's shoes and then tell a story? And then also, how do you um, tell a story that is real and uh, data-driven? So um, I think it taught me how to be more relatable as an academic as well. Oh, yeah, that's fantastic. That's great. Um, Johan, how about you? All right. So as far as like skills and knowledge goes, I think for knowledge, right, I was, I've always been very interested in the politics of the different countries in the ASEAN region. And to be able to actually interact or at least like get a first-hand experience of what it's like like you know how activism and politics were in um, Malaysia was and I also went on to do the EnviroLab Asia trip in Vietnam so I got to see how you know environmental activism is conceived there. I thought that was a very 
eye-opening, impactful experience that I probably would not have been able to get the kind of like firsthand um, experience, which I definitely could not get just reading or on the news or even watching like videos on YouTube. So I thought that was really, really unique in how it gave me an insight into these different communities. Not to say that I understand them fully, but I definitely would understand way more than I would have had I just been reading about it. And the second point is, the, second, the skill that I thought was really, really integral and something which I never experienced before as well would be like John, we say field research, like being able to go down to Sarawak and go up to Vietnam. I'm, I'm speaking down and up relative to where Singapore is, just so you know. Uh, I found it to be very different because you always think of like before that, I, I, I have always conceived of academia as like, you know, sit behind a computer, occasionally you make your way to the library, find a few books, pick up a few quotes, you know, you churn something out, something like that. But it made research more not just more real, but also more personal and more informed, you know, so to get a kind of like first-hand primary source and to like actually write it, write out like a reflection piece where I actually was very, very invested in writing and felt that it could make a little impact as opposed to a very generic academic paper mm. that I may have written before a few times. I thought that was the idea of field research really opened my eyes to a whole new, to new possibilities and how one can approach uh, academia and study of issues. Great, that's all wonderful. I mean, it's so it's it's so nice to hear this. I mean, it's so nice to hear generally everything that you've said about your experiences, what you've gone from EnviroLab Asia practically, theoretically, knowledge-wise and so forth and how it's um, helped you with, with your career, but also just in your general, general life, of course, um, which is the most important thing about how does it help with your life. Um, before we go to the next question, I wanna, uh, we're gonna have time for Q and A. So uh, for anyone who's watching, I encourage you to start uh, kind of inputting your questions in the Q and A uh, function of Zoom, um, go ahead and just, um, Put, put down your question and then we'll be happy to uh, 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 um, uh, ask the question to the to the panelists uh, after this uh, last question. So the last question is, is asking, um, what what's your most memorable experience of, of your time with EnviroLab Asia? Yeah. Um, let's go with uh, Maddie, you wanna go first? Yeah, so, well, I still remember the trip like it was yesterday. Um, there was one memory where we were out on those boats for forever and it started pouring and there was a rainbow and everyone just got out and like looked at our surroundings and it was beautiful. Um, so there was that, but then the other, <laughs> The other memory that is really strong and that I wrote a paper about in my ballet class actually at Pomona was when we were learning different indigenous, like an indigenous dance um, with, with the Dayak community in this, I think it was in a, a long house or I just remember the kind of the, the floor that we were on and then there was a, an elder who was playing a a certain instrument, I'm forgetting the name of the instrument, but it was made out of wood that was only found in that local forest. And I think there was a discussion about how that music was only possible because of sort of those um, local resources and the cultural significant of, of that place um, and that dance. And I danced all throughout college. Um, and so I thought it was a really wonderful way to communicate because there are a lot of language barriers, but in that dance, it was a great moment of um, cross exchange um, in it in a really meaningful way. Great, thank you. Uh, how about Isabel? This is a funny question because there's only one memory that comes to mind that I always tell people when I talk about this trip is like, it was just such an adventure, like from the car ride up the forest, you know, sitting in the middle seat, 
falling asleep, having my head bump up against the top of the car, and then waking up all of a sudden from like sleeping on the wooden planks on a sleeping bag to seeing Albert kitted out in his REI like mosquito tent thing. Oh my gosh, it was, and just like the bucket shower and not knowing what was in the bucket shower, but just wanting a shower so bad that I didn't even care. It was just such an adventure. And even like that same evening, all of us just crowded around, like learning about the stars and constellations and stuff. And it was just such an adventure, like of my life and something I often like tell people about these like little pockets of memories that I remember um, that have really left an impression on me. And it yeah, wasn't all no. horrible. It was, it wasn't as horrible as I like say, but these are just like moments that I think back to and laugh or think fondly of. Yeah, no, that's that, everything that you're saying, I can clearly remember. I, yes, I remember every aspect of it, right? That car ride, wow, that was, that was, yeah. Um, yeah, that was pretty memorable. Um, let's see, um, Elizabeth, you want to go next? So I have two, I, the one, so the trip obviously was a huge highlight, an amazing experience. My one big memory from that is trying durian for the first time. Um, and I had heard of durian. I'd never had it before. It was so good. And there was just so much durian there. Everyone was just constantly like, cutting open a durian, just eating the durian. One memory, my second memory, not on the trip. Um, and this is actually my like most prominent memory. I don't know why, but it was after we'd come back from our trip. I think we were wrapping up the end of the year and we all had dinner together at professor Stephen Mark's house. Um, and he made this big meal. And I just had this like really warm memory of this sense of like, this community in that moment. We were all there together, professors, students, his family was there. I, once again, uh, I'd never had a pomelo before and there was pomelo at dinner and I was like, this is amazing. Um, but it really just like brought together that like, I was learning a lot, I was building this community. Um, and it, it just, it, it, it just kind of like sealed the whole trip all together. Like I, we created this community that felt really special um, to me. So that's, that, those are my two prominent memories. Hey, thanks, um, Johan. Yeah. All right, so one of the memories that I had was definitely part of Ever Left Asia, but not necessarily the clinic trip itself. And I'm not sure how many of you were there, but we had that, I think it was a like Malaysian composer, uh, Yi Kaho, is that right, Professor Park? Yeah, and I remember we saw the whole performance in one of the performance venues of the Claremont Colleges. And, I thought it was super impactful, like the way that he used uh, music and art to, you know, carry his points across, especially, you know, in a, in a, very, in a context fairly familiar to me as someone who's from Singapore and he's from Malaysia. So that was something which I had never seen before. So I thought that was such a profound way to carry across a message. And so that was a very indelible memory. The other one would be not so much a specific point in any time of the trip, but like a series of like little conversations that we had throughout the trip, be it like, you know, in the airport or in the car or, you know, walking around. And it was so interesting to be able to be surrounded by such a diverse group of people as far as like, you know, academic skills go and such an intelligent group of people as far as the professors go. And like, you know, you normally don't, I always tell like, whenever I speak about EnviroLab, you know, you rarely have the chance to, you know, to like live alongside your own professors and not just one, but like a bunch of them for like many days. And like, you know, talk to them about, you know, like academic stuff, you know, lots of thinking. And also talk to them about like just random stuff and get to know them better. But as far as like, you know, learning goes, like it was such a, no, it really challenged me to think and really exposed me to a lot of new forms of information to be talking to people with such uh, diverse uh, academic fields and to also get to know them better because I think the community was one, like uh, Elizabeth mentioned, one really special part of it. Like I really enjoyed the trip as far as like getting to know these people who I ordinarily wouldn't have met in CMC for the most part as I'm going to be Janvi. And for me, that was really special and I really, really enjoyed that trip. Probably one of the most impactful experiences of my life. 
Yeah, I, I think I, I think all everyone spoke well about how we built this community for that first year, and like the clinic trip really just clinched everything and brought everyone together. I mean, the clinic trip we we really were like unguarded. I mean, because we were next to each other doing stuff. We were basically with each other constantly, right, in different circumstances and and so forth, right. And um, and I yeah, I still talk about it with my family and friends very memorably, right, um, um, in, in every way. But I, I would have to say, if I would just add it, I mean, I think the most wonderful thing about it was, I think for it's me, and I could speak probably to the other faculty lab leaders, is really, like, this was the most intense time we could talk with, like, the students, right? I mean, right, we usually just interact with you just in the class, right, and maybe outside a little bit. But here, we were night and day together right, near each other and just talking. And, um, and you know, for me, that's what I always treasure, just learning from your perspective uh, about how you were seeing everything and how it made me rethink some of my ways of thinking and how to look at the world, um, especially through the lenses that you provided. So I think professors also, I mean, everyone, and there was a good number of professors on that trip too. We, we, we had these really intense and wonderful conversations with you all, so that was great. Um, so we have um, a couple questions here. So I'm just gonna go down the list. Uh, we have a little over 10 minutes and hopefully we'll get, we'll, we'll get through all of them because there is about um, not that many. So um, some specific questions to uh, the panelists. So um, the first one um, from Terrell Jones. Uh, hello, Johan, this is Terrell Jones. Uh, good to see you. Um, based on your experiences at CMC and EnviroLab, what do you tell your current students about college in general and about college in the U.S. more specifically? Yeah. Uh, hi, Taro. Uh, for those who are wondering, Taro was one of my journalism lecturers. Well, he's the only journalism lecturer I ever had, so yeah, in uh, CMC. Oh, wow, what I tell my students about my about college in general and college in the US more specifically. Oh, man, what do I tell them? I see them every day, so I tell them a lot of things offhand. <laughs> but I, I feel like I would just give them a really generic, um, oh, oh, college and experience, a college in the US is more holistic than that of Singapore. Um, it opens your eyes to different experiences and, you know, it pushes you to do things that you wouldn't ordinarily do. Um, yeah, I wish I had a great answer to this question, but right now I can only think of, you know, how it was such a vehicle, such like a gateway to like many different learning experiences and how, especially like the liberal arts college experience was more discussion-based and involve more active learning and involve more um, experiential learning and how if they had the chance they should consider studying overseas. That's all I have to say. Um, great. Well, there is another panelist, uh, Fernando, that um, is here. Uh, hope you're doing well. Um, uh, it's definitely good to see you. Uh, yeah, hi guys, good morning from where I am. Very nice to see you guys. Um, we kind of went through the questions already, but this is kind of the Q&A session. So uh, hopefully you can chime in, um, uh, chime in um, uh, during the, one of the questions. Uh, sure. So yeah, so let's go to the next one. Oh, okay, it's for Maddie. So Maddie. Is there sustainable oil palm? I remember many discussions that there's no such thing as sustainable oil palm. How has your perspective changed? Marty, P.S. Nice to see you and everyone. Yeah, Marty. <laughs> we talked about this a lot. Oh man, I don't know. Like that question, I have a different answer to on a daily basis. I mean, the standard, the roundtable on sustainable palm oil standard has changed a lot even since the clinic trip. Um, it was most last, it was last updated in 2020 and now it includes a lot of the criteria that um, most groups were critical of. So there are protections for peatlands and secondary forests and high conservation values and a lot of social um, protections as well. 
So the standards are closer to perfect, but the implementation is still so questionable. And especially in the US compared to Europe, um, manufacturers still can't source segregated sustainable palm oil like it just it just doesn't exist because the the investment in actually separating palm oil throughout the entire supply chain just hasn't been made there's still so many kind of invisible transactions of palm oil um, and ways of of mixing um mixing sort of on paper and like physical shipments of palm oil so on whole, I don't know if there's anything as, as sustainable palm oil, but I can't tell you that because I work in palm oil sustainability now. And um, if I didn't believe that, the, that there was potential for it, I wouldn't be working on this on a daily basis. But um, yeah, there are, there are different supply chain models that have more or less components of sustainability in them but even things like mass balance where palm oil is is mixed from certified and uncertified sources that still has some social benefits for smallholders who wouldn't have the ability to become certified just because of lack of scale and just it's really expensive so still is a really it really that question still i'm still trying to answer it <laughs> All right, great. Um, next question is to Isabel. Uh, it's from Rohan. Hi, Isabel. I was hoping to ask you a question. During your undergraduate studies, did you always know you were going to do marine biology? And if not, what is the story of your journey towards your pursuing a master's? Yeah, hi, Rohan. So actually, 10-year-old Isabel wanted to pursue marine biology for the rest of her life. But when it came down to choosing my undergrad degree, um, I wanted a more holistic approach. Um, I was actually gonna go into environmental science, but then I had some professors that urged me to go the hard route first, like just go science, take biology, and then you can always go back to um, policy if you're interested in that afterwards, because it's hard to do it the other way around. Um, but I decided to do both. So that's why I double majored in bio and environmental policy. Um, but yeah, I, after graduating, I felt like I needed to still pursue that master's degree to focus in on like this lifelong dream of mine to pursue marine biology. Um, and that's where I am today, but I am trying to figure out a way to incorporate um, like a very interdisciplinary approach to my future because I don't think I wanna go purely into marine biology. Okay, great. Um, so we have one more question. Uh, um, actually, this okay, here's the question. Um, let's see, it's from James and it's a general question. It says, hi all, I'm CMC 25 and planning on majoring environmental analysis. For the panelists, do you think EnviroLab Asia gave any of you more clarity on what, you're, on what you, what you wanted to do in your career, um, has it helped uh, any of you refine your uh, interests? And for this question, um, Janavi, um, maybe you can start and then Elizabeth and then Fernando. Yeah, sorry, I was trying to unmute myself. Um, yeah. yeah, I think EnviroLab Asia taught me that I liked thinking about problems from multiple perspectives. Um, and so in that sense, it did change my, my major while I was at school. So from chemistry to science management, and then from science management and being um, a pretty academic and research focused student to thinking about like industry and impact and then getting into tech. So it changed both like my career trajectory at college and then my life trajectory. But I think in the future, I will always continue to think about problems from multiple perspectives. And and uh, yeah, so the, the short answer is yes, EnviroLab shaped, uh, gave me more clarity on what I wanted to do in my career. And it will always be an interest of mine and hopefully help me intersect tech with sustainability in the future. Elizabeth, do you wanna go? Yeah, so I also majored in environmental analysis and I knew I wanted to do something environmental, but it felt so broad. And I think EnviroLab actually really helped me center in on what I wanted to do. And this has been touched on a lot in this discussion, but people-based environmental 
um, comp, uh, issues and sustainability like that. Um, and I think that's driven me to now getting a master's in public health, specifically environmental public health, because I want to combine the environment and people. Because I, I think through the, the trip, there was a lot of, um, there was, it was mostly focused on people's livelihood, social justice, um, so that kind of stuff. And so I think it, it really did help. Um, it, it, it gave me a lot of opportunity to see a lot of different sides of the environmental sphere that it is and helped me narrow in on what I want to do. So definitely. Fernando, do you want to finish up here? Yes. First, of all, first of all, I'm so, so sorry that I'm late, um, but I'm here now. So I, I'm, I'm happy okay. that I answered this last question um, because EnviroLab has been kind of a, was a part of my college career. Um, I would say that it was really the first time that I got a real taste of academic and professional work on the ground in the developing world. Um, and that was really quite vital to me. Um, I, I come from the Philippines and I went to the States for and I was doing engineering and mud and you know, everyone go, gets into tech, everyone goes to the Bay and, and it kind of, it's kind of a one track kind of thing. Um, but EnviroLab really helped me broaden my mind and kind of planted this nascent realization in my head that kind of going back to the Philippines, doing work on the ground in the developing world, that's really where um, a large amount of impact can be made and perhaps where a large, large amount of impact I can make. Um, so EnviroLab was, was very, very vital in helping me realize that and, and kind of steering me to find those kind of opportunities. Great, thanks for, thanks for that. Um, I think, yeah, we're, well, we have one minute and to Carol, so, so since you all left, we actually changed up the clinic trip, cl clinic trip class model. So you know, now we have a class, a dedicated class that people, EnviroLab Asia fellows have to apply to get into. We've had great turnout. So every year we get around 150 applicants for 16 spots. And then they're split up into labs. And then each lab um, with students is led by a faculty member. So we have next year we're going to have four, and Terrell, uh, who's at CMC, teaches journalism, is one of those uh, who's going to lead a lab. And he had uh, one question. I think it's more generally speaking that you can um, apply to and think about just generally um, uh, about the professors who are going to be part of this program. So he asked, "What advice would you give to future lab leaders on trips to Asia?" So like I guess the faculty leaders who are going to lead the clinic trips and and take the students. Is there any advice you would give to any of these future faculty uh, leaders? Very deep question, I know. So take a minute. Maybe I could chime in. Yeah, go ahead. Um, what I found really rewarding about our clinic trip to Singapore, Indonesia, Borneo, um, was the richness of the stakeholder engagement that we got to do. So we got to talk to all kinds of people from protesters on the ground to NGOs, to consumer groups, to corporations, and, how, and, and seeing how to deal with the problem. Um, and I would say that that is really what I take away from the trip. Um, the level of stakeholder engagement that we were able to do, um, because I, I, would, I, I think I'm speaking for most of us where we really, really weren't able to do that beforehand. You know, when you're in school, you're kind of just in the library reading books or doing online research, not really talking to people firsthand. Um, and again, I think that that was a wonderful thing that we got to do. Um, and it's something that I get to do now in my job currently. Um, um, we do stakeholder engagements every time we roll up and I always think back to EnviroLab, like this is the first time I got to do it. Um, yeah. A, a really quick note to add to that. Um, if you could share the perspective of the students that none of the relationships built during EnviroLab are temporary. Like I remember after we came back from our clinic trip and still feeling a huge sense of community with our class. And, you know, I still feel like if any of us 
uh, met up and uh, many of us have, it would be exactly the same and we would be able to talk about the topics that we all care about really deeply. But also, um, I remember getting an email from Peter, who was the nonprofit leader that we worked with in Borneo, uh, uh, telling us about like his life update on where his daughter was studying and just like general life advice. and. I remember that making a really long lasting impression because it was like, this isn't temporary. These are people that will continue to remain in my mind and life for the rest of it. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, anyone else have any last minute advice before you finish off? I mean, I think what it seems like the, I mean, it seems like the clinic trip, I mean, every, all different aspects of my life as you know, help, but the clinic trip in particular because you got to experience so much and got to encounter so many people. I think that's important for any clinic trip. And that's what it's for, right? To, to kind of connect to what you've learned, right? Because you're right, Fernando, we are mostly in the libraries or in our books. And a lot of things are very theoretical, but the clinic trip makes things very more real and more apparent and it connects. And you, we make um, these, these um, as Janavi says, these, these uh, connected relationships and these uh, good, these relationships that last. Um, so I think that's that's a real value and, and of, of the clinic trip and faculty leaders, um, we pick faculty leaders specifically kind of who have these experiences and connections that allow the students to um, uh, meet all these different stakeholders um, for sure. Um, so yeah, we're, we're, we're out of time today. I mean, we, it's so it's 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 really remarkable and lovely to see all of you and to see your faces, to see that you're all doing well and staying healthy. I mean, it's so impressive. I mean, I uh, it's it's really impressive to to see how well everyone's doing in their careers and how you're excelling. Um, that's what every professor likes to see in their in their students. Um, I think it comes as I said, no surprise because. When we interacted with you, uh, all of you, um, we, we knew that you were fantastic and just really well-grounded students, right? Who made, um, who is gonna build a foundation for EnviroLab Asia. So I, I can personally say probably the, like Mark, Brandon, Tamara, everyone who's been involved in EnviroLab Asia are not surprised of how well things have gone, gone for you. And we really hope that one day you can come back to the campus when when it's safe, right? Maybe during alumni weekend or something along those lines, and we could we could see you because you're you're always welcome to come back, and it'd be great also to connect you to our classes too, because you you now all have these wonderful and real life experiences that you can share, right, to the, the student, and that's really valuable, right? It is really valuable. So we're gonna try to make more opportunities where we can bring you back, right? Not only to see you guys and socialize and hang out. But more importantly, for you to like, you know, you can contribute back to the 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 college, the mission of the college, right? And and of all the colleges, and that that's just great. So, um, so th thank you everyone for attending. We're gonna, we, this is recorded, so we're definitely going to publicize this recording. We're gonna show it to future Envira Lab um, applicants and so forth. Um, and um, so thank you everyone for taking your time out to join us. Thanks everyone here um, for. Uh, uh, taking your time out, busy time out, especially those people in Asia today. So um, take care, uh, take care, and I will see you all soon. Okay, bye. Thanks, Thanks. everyone. Thank you. Bye. bye. Take bye. care. Bye. Take care.